Welcome to an electrifying journey through the week of space awesomeness. If you want to see where all that attention is being spent to prepare for the next Starship flight, this is certainly the place to be. Now wait, is that what we think it is? And what's going on here? Yes, those my friends are great questions, so let's do this. Okay, Neil, we can see you coming down the ladder now. <laughs> this video is supported by Brilliant. Hey hey, Marcus House with you here, and in the aftermath of the Integrated Flight Test 2 mission, it has been a big point of interest to see where SpaceX would initially focus their efforts. Was there more to be repaired than we may have first expected? Would they rip out the vertical tank farm and replace a bunch of stuff? Maybe the groundwork for a second Mechazilla Tower Foundation would start appearing. These are all very good questions. Let's start with these scenes. SpaceX are certainly gearing up for a tank farm upgrade, but perhaps not what you thought. The week prior, the more obvious upgrades that we knew were most likely coming kicked right off, that being hooking up and integrating those new pumps and subchillers on both the liquid oxygen and the liquid methane sides of the orbital tank farm. These additions will simply increase the propellant flow rate and allow the fully stacked vehicles to be filled quite a lot faster for launch. That probably doesn't seem overly critical, does it? But a faster fill and countdown process means less boil off and therefore less waste. The bigger question though was would they change much to do with the tanks themselves? RGV aerial photography has been constantly snapping the best views possible from right above the site. We've been waiting patiently to see when these pedestals near the existing tank farm would be utilised. Similar to nearby, you can see that these horizontal tanks are placed on top of these to give some ground clearance. Well, wait no more, because this week, down the road they came. Starship Gazer caught some excellent photos of the first ones rolling down Highway 4. Again, the scale of a tank here is quite significant. That truck behind the tank looks tiny in comparison. Even the semi-truck that's actually delivering it looks kind of tiny. Anyway, afterward, Anthony Gomez, our friend from the Rocket Ranch, caught the second one passing by only the day after. Both of these tanks were manoeuvred right up to the main launch site gate, slowly reversed in, and were eventually placed down next to the existing methane tanks here. Over the next few days, the tanks continued arriving. However, they skipped these slightly different offset mount points. A different tank is most likely coming soon for those. Now, it's not exactly clear what all of these tanks are going to be holding. While they are next to the methane tank farm, and up to this point we've been assuming methane, an expansion of only methane at this scale would seem kind of unusual. Perhaps this is part of a bigger refurbishment. Texas regulation states that there needs to be a six foot clearance surrounding the methane tanks, as well as a low wall to prevent spillage in case of a leak. Well, if you look carefully, this tank right at the end isn't hooked up at all. This could mean that these new tanks are for liquid oxygen, liquid nitrogen, or perhaps both. If the nitrogen was sitting in the middle separating the two flight propellants, that should free up all of the vertical tanks still holding the cryogenic nitrogen and oxygen. Now we know that SpaceX have been wanting over time to remove some, if not all of those custom built vertical tanks. Obviously, they were beaten up quite badly in Flight Test 1. They did do some temporary repairs, but these two tanks got pushed in again by Flight 2, mainly by the exhaust pressure, as far as we can tell. Just to add to this, those tanks previously planned to hold the methane didn't get filled with the perlite insulation like they did with the nitrogen and oxygen. That means that these ones are basically a thin and unpressurized stainless steel shell. Yeah, they are quite fragile, those. This old original water tank we don't believe is being used at all, but they are are, we believe, still using this super dented one to supply water to the FireX system. In the end, those custom vertical tanks may have seemed like a good idea at first, but their height leaves them vulnerable to damage from anything flying off the vehicle or the pad. Comparatively, the horizontal tanks can be protected and hidden away by the berm a lot easier. We'll just need to see how this progresses. Now over to the orbital launch mount, both of the booster stabilization points were once again installed on top of the deck this week. These, which you may recall, are needed when carefully stacking the next booster onto the mount. Interestingly, we could see this hold down clamp being removed, presumably for repair, but given the fact that they are already adding these stabilization points, I think it's a fair assumption that overall, the launch mount is really in a far better state compared to the first flight. In the end, the main holdup I think before we can see Booster 10 roll out for its static fire campaign is, I suspect, going to be the tank farm upgrades. Moving over to the suborbital side of the site, it's also been interesting seeing this new attention, although not exactly what you might think. For the last month or so, we've seen them installing this large new wall that goes around the back of the new car park. 
Once this particular section was painted black and the wires were fed through at specific locations, we were looking at three new words. Randolph Visuals was on the scene once again, catching these letters rolling in on a trailer. This was a bit of a puzzle as some of the pieces are upside down and in the wrong order, but as was becoming very obvious, this would spell out Gateway to Mars. As usual, SpaceX got straight to work installing them. First came the R, followed by the S, and before we knew it, the rest of the installation made it very obvious that Gateway to Mars was indeed the phrase to run along that wall. That is a great addition to the Starbase sign up the road at the build site. It's amazing how fast SpaceX gets all these things done. Big work has been going on with Ship 28, the next Starship to fly. It has been receiving heat shield tiles throughout the week, and almost all the missing spots along the sectional world lines, along with the stray missing tiles, have now been replaced. Before they actually attach tiles to the ships, SpaceX usually cleans the stainless steel barrel a little, adds the insulation blanket on, and then they finally click the tiles on. Now this time they look to have been really detailed in the cleaning process, which is interesting, with so many tiles going missing in flight to a along some of those sectional world lines, they are probably really trying to dial in the process for attaching the tiles in this area. Elon recently revealed that ships between 28 and 32 will be the last generation of version 1 Starships. Starship version 2 is going to hold more propellant, the dry mass of the ship will decrease, and reliability will be improved. Now, he didn't go into exactly what these new changes are, so it's down to a bit of speculation until we get more confirmation. In the past, SpaceX have hinted that the length of the Starship may increase. We assume by stretching the length of the liquid oxygen and the methane tanks. Now that all should be possible without any big changes needed on the launch site. They do of course need to ensure that they can still lift the ships in place, so if they're getting too tall to clear the booster, they may then need to move the lift points further down the vehicle. They have obviously been playing with prototypes that have much flatter domes, which should allow them to fill the propellant space much better too, so all this would help. I think it is a reasonable assumption that version 2 will also include the three extra Raptor vacuum engines. Now, by improving reliability, there are so many things that he could mean here. Hopefully, some of this is talking about improving the tile attachment methods. It sure would be great to see those sticking much more reliably. We also know that they are always tweaking the Raptor engine design, so improvement there I think is a given. Regardless, there are so many fun changes to explore as we see them pop up, and I can't wait to see what we discover. Over at the Massey site, Starship Gazer was back again, able to catch this photo of the Ship 24.2 testing article. If we zoom into the bottom world here, you can see that there's quite a noticeable dent. This tank is being used to verify the structural performance of the payload bay section on the ships in different stages of flight. Perhaps in this case, they've pushed it well beyond the expected flight loads to determine a limit. It could of course be a failure of a weld or the structure within the expected limits. Nothing official has been said about it at this stage. Now, I did just want to take a second to shout out the Space Engineer for putting this animation together for everybody to check out. We have been madly discussing and debating the issue that led to the destruction of the booster after the hot staging and boost back sequence. Scott, Fraser and I talked about this reasonably extensively in our discussion the other day. Link below if you happen to miss that one. But seeing some of these theories in a simulated form like this adds even more intrigue. Now we believe that negative acceleration occurred during the hot staging, followed by positive acceleration again while quite aggressively flipping backward. Based on the 3,400 metric tons of propellant for a full load as stated on SpaceX's website, there could have been as much as 300 tons of liquid mass causing all that sensitive plumbing to have a very bad day. A link to the Space Engineer animation is below. We'd love to know what you think that may need alteration or improvement in this. It's always fun speculating on these things. Speaking of the flight, you may have noticed that this new version of the design now comes with the date printed on it, so you can pick this up or the version without the date for just a few more weeks before we finally put that design to rest. A huge thank you to Tony Bella for designing and partnering with me to make all these available for you. All profits have been split right down the middle to help Tony's amazing infographic work. It is of course that time of year once more, so a neat option for gifting away. Likewise, people that just love the star desk here venting away behind me too. A special link for that is also below. We are all so grateful that you love what we do. Thanks for subscribing and following them on their various platforms. That helps them just as much as it does me right here. 
Now, SpaceX were back launching the very fun Falcon 9s again this week. This here was the 425 Project mission launching from Vandenberg Space Force Base, the first of an epic series of five launches for the South Korean Defense Acquisition Program Administration, or DAPA. More than that, this was yet another mesmerizing return to launch site mission, which I'll get back to in just a second. On board, between the fairings, a reconnaissance satellite equipped with an electro-optical infrared telescope. The other four missions that will follow will collectively add four more more synthetic aperture radar satellites to the party by 2025. These satellites are to be placed into a low Earth orbit somewhere between 600 and 700 kilometers in altitude. The aim of all this defensive capability, of course, is to give South Korea's military a front row seat to watch what is going on around the North Korean military facilities. After all, the Malyong-1, a reconnaissance satellite launched almost two weeks ago by North Korea, is claimed to be tasked with spying on South Korean and American targets. There have even been stories this week claiming that this has been looking over the White House, the Pentagon and nuclear aircraft carriers. Needless to say, this 425 mission launched by Falcon 9 will have a resolution between 30 and 50 centimetres. Given the spectacular nature of these return to launch site missions, here we were back again watching the super clear footage of the Falcon 9 landing right on target. It never gets old, that shot. Also along for the ride on this same flight were 25 other rideshare missions, including IRSAT-1, a development that has been led by University College Dublin since 2017. Interestingly, this is Ireland's first satellite. It may only be a CubeSat, but not only will it demonstrate innovative Irish technology, it also hopes to encourage collaboration between students, education institutions and tech companies. Always great to see projects that inspire the next generation of students to invest more in STEM subjects. Another Falcon 9 flew earlier in the week as well for Starlink Group 630 from Cape Canaveral, Florida. This was a well-loved booster, number 1062 on its 17th flight now. Another clean separation and there it was coming down on the drone ship Just Read the Instructions. So yes, just like that, SpaceX adds another batch of 23 Starlink version 2 minis to orbit. The next launch in the series for Group 631 was due to fly right as we were rendering this video. Well, assuming that it hasn't been pushed for some reason, that was to be sending another 23 to orbit and was to land on a shortfall of gravitas. Just take a look at this. The upper mass carried to orbit by SpaceX alone was illustrated beautifully here by Bryce Tech showing quarter three of this year. Yes, China did a lot of individual launches, but SpaceX put up over 15 times the mass in the same time. That is way more than all the space agencies combined across the globe by a colossal margin. So Blue Origin have been back in the news this week, and behold, we are actually seeing some new Glenn hardware out on the site thanks to Max with NASA Spaceflight. It isn't actually overly clear if this is actual flight hardware that we are seeing, or if it's some kind of well-branded test tank or pathfinder, but it is interesting that we are now seeing this. Just for reference, if we compare this to the full diagram, you can see that this makes up the first stage here, but it is obviously missing quite a large aft module with the engines. None of the fin or the strike hardware can be seen anywhere either. Now, just in relation to this, you may have spotted just recently that NASA is expecting the Escapade mission to be riding on the very first New Glenn flight in 2024. We hadn't heard that before, although we did know that Escapade would be flying on New Glenn in general. It seems a little risky to put an important mission on the first launch though, doesn't it? Well, NASA have deemed this an acceptable risk given that Escapade is categorized as a Class D mission. Essentially, they are willing to take a higher flight risk on missions like this. It is the schedule risk that I'm more intrigued about though. There has of course been a lot of skepticism with that timeline considering just how little that we tend to see from Blue over the past few years. Seeing this image though may be a good indication that indeed they are going for that mission so they don't lose the opportunity to meet the contract deadline. Blue Origin have mentioned that the first flight vehicle would arrive at Florida for the next steps by the end of this year, also suggesting multiple launches next year. That seems a little optimistic given that we've just recently heard that NASA is excited for Escapade to launch in about a year's time from now. So yeah, that is a reasonably big pushback from August in 2024. What do you think? Could we really see New Glenn fly next year or will the vehicle continue to remain elusive? Let me know. 
Now at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Southern California, engineers are testing the capability of the next generation Mars helicopters. In this 25-foot space simulator where legacy space missions like Surveyor, Voyager and Cassini were tested, this carbon fibre rotor spins at near supersonic speeds, nearly 750 revolutions per minute faster than Ingenuity's. Yes, it seems like these longer, stronger blades designed for future Mars helicopters are not just theoretical, they are ready to take flight. It isn't overly surprising to me that they are making the push more urgently with this technology given the success of Ingenuity. This little Mars helicopter just keeps making more and more strides in the Martian sky. Just earlier this month, it successfully finished its 66th flight. Given that the original hope was that it could perhaps perform just five flights, you can see why they are beginning to look at the next in line. Each flight on Mars is a new achievement in one shape or another, whether it be new imagery or data gained, or simply new flight records being broken. NASA has even managed to double the helicopter's maximum airspeed and altitude from earlier flights, getting Ingenuity to 24 meters high with max speeds of 10 meters per second, certainly pushing the limits of what anyone thought was possible. Now, communication with Mars has recently been blocked for a little while due to a solar conjunction, but now that is clear, Ingenuity is going to start preparing for its next two high-speed flights. They are going to involve more daring pitch and roll angles to measure its performance. I think it's really been a monstrous few weeks seeing all the innovation exploding around the space industry. I really hope this stuff inspires the new generations coming through schools and universities to think seriously about getting into this exact industry. Perhaps it all sounds a bit daunting, but you might be surprised. Luckily, our incredible sponsor Brilliant provides the best way to learn and gain loads of knowledge. Better still, it doesn't need to cost the world or take a bunch of years of schooling. If you want a free and easy way to learn about so many of these topics, consider checking Brilliant out. It'll supercharge your problem-solving skills, all while guiding you through incredible interactive lessons, beautifully designed for busy people. Scientific thinking is a mindset that we can always improve, and no matter what level, it is amazing how much of that foundational knowledge is critical to further understanding as you advance towards mastery. Transfer of force, just as one example, might seem like a basic idea, but it can soon get pretty complex. Likewise, fluid dynamics is critical in so many industries and applications, no matter if you are working on your own water storage systems or filling a gigantic tank farm full of cryogenic propellant. There is just so much here to discover, no matter what your interests are. It could be data science or analysis, artificial intelligence, neural networks, programming, algorithms, engineering, you name it. These bite-sized segments simplify complex concepts, helping you to level up your STEM skills. Invest a little time each day and you will quickly see a substantial improvement in your understanding and knowledge. To try all that Brilliant has to offer free for 30 days, visit brilliant.org slash Marcus House or click that link in the description below. The first 200 of you will get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. Thank you, Brilliant. Sierra Space continues to throw amazing scenes out there for us all. Here, they have revealed that massive life inflatable habitat test article that will be pushed to destruction. This is over six meters tall, a little over eight meters wide, and has around 283 cubic meters of volume. Yes, this is going to make quite the pop. To pass that test, it needs to hold at least 60.8 pounds per square inch of pressure, but I'll bet it gets well beyond that. You may also recall me talking a few weeks ago about the Shooting Star cargo module that was to be soon tested for the Dream Chaser vehicle. Well, that environmental testing has begun because here it was arriving at NASA's Neil Armstrong Test Facility in Ohio. Provided that it passes all the required tests, this module is what will end up helping to resupply the International Space Station with the Dream Chaser. Speaking of ISS supply, the Progress MS-25 mission is now on its way, blasting off from the Baikonur spaceport. On board, around 2.5 tonnes of cargo, including the usual propellant, water and whatnot, but also some New Year's gifts for the crew on board the station. That should be docking over the next day. Now, Firefly are back in the headlines again as they completed their very first hot fire test for their Miranda engine in Texas. This image has already prompted some questions asking if the green exhaust colour is bad there. Well, it certainly would be if the engine was eating itself like we've seen in destructive tests such as SpaceX's Starship SN8 flight test three years ago. This colour, on the other hand, is from the T-TEB ignition fluid used by Firefly for this very engine. Similar, in fact, to the Falcon 9 rocket, which, if you look closely at the start of a landing burn will have that telltale green exhaust for a very brief moment. 
So this new Miranda engine is very different to the Reaver engines that are used on Firefly Alpha. They are in fact much smaller, producing a thrust of about 184 kilonewtons. This new, much more hefty Miranda engine, on the other hand, puts out about five and a half times more thrust at 1,023 kilonewtons. So yeah, this one engine puts out more thrust than all four of the Reaver engines combined on the Firefly Alpha rocket. That was of course last seen in the Victus Nox mission launched a few months back in mid-September. That mission was very successful, but we hadn't heard a great deal more about the next generation engine that they were working on. This new Miranda engine will be powering the first stage of Northrop Grumman's Antares 330 rocket, along with the medium launch vehicle that they are developing together. It's actually going to take seven of these to provide the needed power to hurl the Antares 330 out of the atmosphere. That is a total of around 7,160 kilonewtons, or 1.6 million pounds of force. Yeah, that's pretty cool. This big change you may recall was made so that they don't need to rely on those Russian-built RD-181 engines anymore. So I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, don't forget to hit subscribe so we get to keep making them. If you would like to help more directly like the many, many amazing people, all of this support makes a colossal difference to us. It really does. If you have just a second to help us with some more space awesomeness, do click on this video here. We are so close to a million views on that video. That would be a huge help. Thanks for watching all this way through, and I will see you all in the next video.